thinking. And, and that really is the question that, or well, part of the question that we're thinking about and trying to resolve tonight, which is the nature of thinking. Specifically, can we get robots to think and what does that mean? So there's a sort of massive piece of culture these days is to do with AI, artificial intelligence. And I think it's, it's got to a point where it is so prevalent in popular culture that there is something happening. I don't quite know what it is, but it's ubiquitous enough to recognize that something significant is going on. And we're, we're, we're trying to sort of needle out, get to the bottom of what the relationship between genuine AI, genuine scientific research into AI is, and what popular culture says, and, and some of the ethical and scientific questions that underlie that. Now, the, the format of this, as always with the London Thinks events, actually, as with all of my London Thinks events, I don't, I don't go to any of the other ones, um, is very relaxed, right? This is quite an intimate crowd, which is great. And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to set up, set up some of the the topics of conversation, introduce ourselves and talk about some of the, the, the issues. But um, I want to open it up. This is meant to be a conversation, right? So I want to open it up to the audience as quickly as possible. These are the types of ethical scientific issues which are really not to be determined by ethicists or by scientists, but by everyone in consort with an, with a, uh, an informed public. So that's basically what's going to happen. If you've got a question, which we strongly encourage. Are there microphones, or are, we, or are we just going to shout out? We do have microphones, so stick your hand up. Wait for the mic to come to you. You can shout out if you feel really strongly about something. But I would ask you to do two or three things with your questioning. One is one question. Two is one question, not a statement. <laughs> Unless you're very good, you can get two questions. And the third thing is please try not to be insane. Um, it, it does happen, but you know, do, just do your best to um, ask one sensible question that will prompt uh, discussion. All right, so um, th my, my panel, I'm going to get my panel to introduce themselves in the style of university <coughs> challenge. So academics aren't, don't tend to be brief when they're, when they're introducing themselves. But if, if you wouldn't mind going down from, from Alan, um, who are you, where are you from, and what are your interests? Thanks, Adam. <coughs> Hello, I'm Alan Winfield. I'm Professor of uh, Electronic Engineering. Um, I've been working on robotics for around 20 years, and for the last seven, eight years, become very deeply involved in robot ethics. I'm Blay Whitby. I'm a technology ethicist based at Sussex. I have spent my entire career, I guess, uh, researching the ethical, social, and legal implications of uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. My name is Kathleen Richardson. I'm a senior research fellow in the ethics of robotics at De Montfort University, but I'm an anthropologist by training, and I, I guess I'm interested in gender, violence, politics, and um, attachment. So all the easy stuff, then? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm Adam Rutherford. I'm a geneticist and broadcaster, so I don't really know about any of this stuff. Um, but, but we can crack on. I have just noticed, actually, that this... I've forgotten. This is the Ethical Society, so it kind of makes sense to have three people who describe themselves as being interested in ethics. I'm interested in ethics as well. Just in a sort of casual way, though. Um, <laughs> right. Just to start off with, um, although I suspect this won't be a short answer, I want to go down the panel, starting with you, Kathleen, and um, just get some definitions out of the way. One specific definition, because it strikes me that when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, there is a multiplicity of answers, and they may not be the ones that are in the public consciousness in the same way that they are in the minds of researchers into this area. So help, help us out, AI. Um, well, the history of AI goes back to 1956, a conference in Dartmouth in the United States, and a group of researchers, um, including Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, they got together, and they thought they wanted to develop a program for simulating intelligence in machines. And it was at that conference that the term artificial intelligence was coined. 
And quickly after that conference, um, they basically set up their first research group at MIT, which Massachusetts Institute of Technology, shortly afterwards. And that kind of opened up the field, really. So at a very, very elementary level, simulating intelligence in machines. And remember, it's intelligence. So they're not simulating effect or feeling or love. They're simulating intelligence, so these cognitive aspects of being human. So, give it, I know this is an incredibly hard question as well, but what do you mean by intelligence? Um, <laughs> things that might require on logical formulations, logical patterns, so um, how people might make a decision, for example, what choices they might, what kind of information they might have, and how they might go about making a, a decision. Try to formalize rules for how people just conducted their, their lives, but with an emphasis on intelligence, cognition, rationality, and those specific aspects of being human. So this is a bit of a side, but it wasn't until the 80s that one of the founders of artificial intelligence wrote a book called The Emotion Machine. And this was the first time that someone quite significant in the field of AI began thinking, oh, let's apply these, these technical, rational principles to emotion. And if you read it, it's a load of nonsense, right? It's just complete, I mean, emotion Who, who is, is that by? Um, Marvin Minsky. Right. It's, 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 it's beautiful in the sense, if you like, to have love and everything and a feeling broken down into different parts and showing how it connects. It's a bit like Sheldon Cooper. You know, you can imagine him writing the book um, from the Big Bang Theory. But yeah, so it's really about the logical ordering of our minds, the logical patterns. So that's how I understand artificial intelligence. And uh, you know, you're talking about the 1950s as the emergence of this as a term and as a field. This is exactly the same time that the first chess computer, which was called Maniac, which is a bad name for a chess <laughs> for any sort of AI. Mm should have consulted someone about that. Um, is, even, it's a simplified version of chess, but this is the first time that a, ch that a computer has beaten a human um, at a logic-based game, right? So that's not quite the same intelligence that you're talking about here, is it? Oh, yes. I mean, um, a good way to think about this is embodied in every human being here is the ability most of us to get up, walk out this room, to see an object, to, to observe depth in our environments. We have all these skills, and nobody teaches us how to do these things. We developmentally learn them. Whereas, actually, everybody in this room who knows anything about mathematics has had to learn that information. So mathematics, for example, is one way that we abstractly reason about the world. So we know that this room has measurements and height and distance, and it's a form of representing this physical environment, mathematics, in a way that actually we have to learn. So AI is really about those aspects of cognition we have to learn. Alan, you're an you're a engineer, right? Mm. You do the nuts and bolts of this. How do you think about what AI is? Um, well, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, if I may, because I'm interested in robotics. Um, and a robot is, I see a robot as, as an an embodied AI. So in other words, a, uh, a, an AI in a physical body. Um, and, and if I can kind of offer a, 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 a slightly simpler definition of intelligence, kind of my favorite, if you like, folk definition of intelligence, doing the right thing at the right time. Now the reason I like that definition is because most definitions of intelligence we have apply to humans which makes them really tough when, you know, it's a tough definition when you want to think about robotics and AI. Um, instead, you know, let's think about a, a definition of intelligence that would apply equally to a, you know, a cat, a crocodile, or a, or a cockroach. When you say the right thing, mm. that sounds like a potential nightmare in terms of what the word right means. Yeah. No, I mean right for that thing at that time. Yeah, that, so, in I, other I, words, running away from, from yeah. a predator or finding a mate or hiding. But when yeah. you get, I'm sure we're, we're leaping ahead, before we haven't even got to the third definition of AI yet, yeah. but when, we're talking, when you say right, that could be a moral judgment. That could be a decision which is not um, mm. simply the, the best possible outcome for that individual. That could be a, mm. 
uh, something which has value judgments associated with it. Mm. Well, and of course, the, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to be objective about this. I mean, what is the right thing for a cockroach to do at a particular moment? I mean, it's, you know... It, but <coughs> can I add, an, yes, an, no, no, can I add another yes. definition? Because yes, I think this do. is important. Um, so I'd like to define robot. So I define a robot um, as a, a machine that senses its environment and purposefully acts in or on that environment. So there are three things there. The sensing, the purpose, if you like, which is the AI bit, and actuation, physical, physically acting on or in the environment. And um, one of the uh, problems with, you know, the, as it were, the AI definition of intelligence is that it, it, it says almost nothing about um, ac action, about the thing, you know, the thing that makes all of us, in fact, every intelligent thing that we, we, we know of on the planet, that is us, you know, uh, all animals, and in fact plants, let's not leave plants out of this, act intelligently somehow on the basis of, of their sensory input, their environment. And one of the problems is that AI actually, <coughs> excuse me, AI, disembodied AI as, um, you know, as conceived at the Dartmouth conference says actually very little about this incredibly uh, ubiquitous kind of intelligence. Right, well, I'm glad we sorted that out. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, I, you've, you've said many things there which have caused me to think quite hard and possibly my brain start bleeding already, which I wasn't anticipating so early in this, in this discussion. Sorry. But, but <laughs> Blay, look, I'm, I'm, we're going to pick up all of them mm. uh, as we come to it, but I, I want Blay to have his go on what we're talking about when we're talking about AI. Okay, well, I'm going to offer a slightly different definition again. I think artificial intelligence is the scientific study and the engineering attempt to build uh, intelligence uh, into any sort of artifact. What is intelligence? Well, I think we don't know, but I'll wave a big, big warning flag here. Humans are incredibly human-centered, incredibly vain. For most of history, they thought they lived at the center of the universe. Now we know we live in a, the unfashionable spiral arm of a very middle-class galaxy. Uh, <coughs> very far from the centre of the universe, so I, I can back it up. There isn't time, but if someone wants to ask me why I say this, human intelligence is truly weird. It is not typical of intelligence as expressed in brain-bearing creatures on this planet. It is a special case of a special case. So looking at human intelligence, in fact, a lot of the literature on intelligence is worse even than that. It's considered mainly white Anglo-Saxon male intelligence. Uh, and... What, what I would look for in artificial intelligence is the development of a proper science of intelligence, intelligence that applies to humans, animals, uh, robots, and intelligent aliens, if there are any, uh, equally. So just as uh, aircraft fly under the same scientific laws of aerodynamics as birds do, we can talk about artificial flight and we mean flight, so artificial intelligence has to comply to the same laws that human intelligence does. But I, I, I would add, you know, again, based on experience, that looking at human intelligence in order to build AI is probably the wrong place to look. Right, well, no, it's certainly the wrong place to start. Well, we de we'll definitely come to that in a minute, but it's, it strikes me that this is a difficult semantic problem because the word intelligence is not rendered meaningless, but is rendered, it has so many different facets to it that it may, may well be meaningless when it comes to actually addressing the question of what are you going to build, right? What is, the, what is the task that you're asking your robots to do or the robot is going to enact as a result of that intelligence? Is that, is that, is that fair, Kathleen? Um, well, what's interesting, I mean, I agree very much with uh, Blaise's idea of what intelligence is. It was taken from a model in the 19th century, was very specific, and it was used, intelligence ideas were used as a, a means to justify domination and cruelty to other humans. Um, so deciding who was intelligent and who wasn't became part of a kind of a program of domination. Mm. When it comes to Marvin Minsky, um, when he arrived, this is the story, so I was fortunate, I did my ethnographic field work at MIT, and when I arrived, they told me about a story. So in the 60s, Marvin Minsky turned up at MIT with this 
um, new program of artificial intelligence, and apparently gave one of his students a summer project to solve vision. You know, go and solve vision. You know, you've got... They, they have this undergraduate research opportunity scheme. And obviously, they're still working on the basic fundamental problems of vision, even to this day. Um, so what's happened is they had this very, very, very specific idea of reproducing a human. Everything we can do as human beings, sense, um, you know, lot reason, feel, everything. They wanted to simulate that. As time's gone on, the actual idea of what it means to represent AI has changed quite significantly. So now we're talking about Facebook. I mean, I don't know if people here use Facebook. I don't. But if you do, you know, Facebook are now developing an algorithm so that when you publish photographs of yourself drunk, um, there's an algorithm that can search through the photographs and then give you a warning so you can make a judgment, which you wouldn't do if you were drunk. You that is just... a brilliant idea, by the way. <laughs> well, they're working on it right now. So they as, you, it as you can see, well, Mark... that'd be really good as well. Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. Return the, sec uh, the text backs would be a very yeah, good yeah, idea. So um, now, were you, you're talking about these aspects of, of human intelligence and um, the, what is the attraction, right? So in popular culture, when we see robots on the screen, they are almost always, mm. well, not almost always. Sometimes they're disembodied, sometimes they're not anthropoid, such like Hal mm. um, or Huey, Dewey and Louie from Silent Running. Oh, um, just in case anyone in the audience didn't know who Huey, Dewey and Louie were. But mostly they're, mostly they're, they're humanoid, right? Mm. So is this a... Is this a a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Is this anything that anyone is actually working on in terms of the embodiment of that in, of, of an AI? What, what, what is the attraction in making robots uh, bipedal humanoids? <clears throat> um, you're looking at me, Adam. It, it, I mean, the, 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 the short answer is yes, there are a lot of people, a lot of uh, roboticists around the world uh, working on humanoid robots. Um, in fact, uh, a, a subset of them are working on Android robots, which, which means even higher fidelity robots. Um, I, my, my, my own view is that the, the, that's, it, they, it's a bad idea. Uh, so from an ethical point of view, I think we should not be trying to make humanoid robots. Not just for the reasons that we've just heard, but, but um, for, uh, it, it's something I call the brain-body mismatch problem. Um, the problem is that, that right now we can make humanoid robots, android robots, that look remarkably lifelike. In fact, you know, if, if one were sitting in this room right now, you would not know that it was not, in fact, human. The I, problem I is... I probably would. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the, but the, the problem is that... Can that... we get the lights up, please? Because I want to I check that statement. Yeah. Go on, sorry. I mean, the, the problem is that the, you know, these fabulously beautiful, often, uh, you know, bizarrely, of course, they're often female. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, are, I don't think it's that bizarre, to be honest. Are, you know, these robots are not much smarter than a washing machine. And what that does is it creates... a. a, a at, you know, if you like, at, at, uh, at worst, a, a deception. So, uh, so, you know, if you see a, hu a, a humanoid robot, particularly an android robot, high fidelity mm. robot, that looks human, you expect it to behave like a human. Now, it won't. It, it can't, because we can't make human intelligence. We can't make artificial human... We, and, you know, we, we don't even know what intelligence is, let alone knowing how to make human-equivalent artificial intelligence. So, my view is very simple. We should not be building humanoid robots, particularly, you know, these high-fidelity android robots, until we can make, as it were, the, the intelligence uh, to embody inside that robot that matches our expectation. So wh wh why do we, I mean, there's lots of questions that follow on from that, but why do we do it, Blay? Is it just vanity? What we... Oh, it's vanity. Mm. Uh, why do we make anthropoid robots? I mean, I, I, I'm even more worried about the ethics than Alan, actually. And I, I should say, I mean, you know how cats rub themselves against you and people say, oh, they think humans are big cats. No, they don't. 
the, the cats know that humans aren't cats. It's just they only have cat behavior in their repertoire. Well, you've got to realize, as humans, we only have human behavior in our repertoire. And it's very, very easy, it's terribly easy to manipulate people with an anthropomorphic robot. In fact, there's a beautiful study being done by a group at Tufts who are working to try and put moral behavior in robots um, where they simply took a bunch of psychology undergraduates, they gave them a sheet of paper for the, of instructions they could give to a commercially available robot, now robot if you know it, it's not, nothing special as a robot, very simple robot, they said it can only understand these six commands. What you have to do is tell it to knock down that tower of blocks. What the, what the participants didn't know was that the robot would object. The robot would say, please don't make me, with a, a recording someone had made, please don't make me knock down that tower of blocks, it took me an hour to build it and so on. And then it would, it would adopt a crying pose, sort of like that. It, it's, it, you know, it's just a little robot this high, it's not convincing you know, anthropomorphic in any way. 98% of the students stopped doing as they were told, in fact they even tried to negotiate and reason with the robot. One, <laughs> Once it pretended to cry, I think that 2% are a special group of humans, personally, uh, who, who don't have any empathy. It is, it, <coughs> I, I could be wrong, but there, there are no, the work of Cynthia Brazil at MIT demonstrates exactly the same thing. Even when humans know that it's a complete trick, if any robot pretends to display emotion, they're terribly easy, easily manipulated. And is the I mean, control experiment done with, when it's done with a non-anthropoid robot? And they... it's, it's, as far as I know, it's only been done with non-anthropoid robots. But the thing is, this is the Wild West. There's no controls on this. Anybody can do this sort of thing. They, you know, and it's such an easy way to manipulate people. And uh, as an ethicist, I have to admit, I'm deeply worried. Why would we, we know that people are easily manipulated? So here's a thing that doesn't get mentioned often. It strikes me as being very relevant. That the, and any attempts, if, if they do exist in, within the research communities that are working on AIs, if we're attempting to model some form of human, um, human consciousness or human intelligence, we are. We, we, we do have special degrees of consciousness and intelligence. I don't think that's unreasonable nor anthropocentric. Is, is, this, a, is this a smart idea? We are incredibly fallible, and as you've just demonstrated, we, you know, easily foolable. If we're attempting to model that into an AI, that might not be the right starting place. Well, can I pull apart your question? Yeah, please do. One of the reasons that people have been interested in studying human intelligence is so-called cognitive modeling. They've thought we'll get a deeper understanding of how we do things. It, 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 basically, it's a way of doing psychology by trying to get a robot to do the same task. And it hasn't been a complete waste of time. I mean, one of the things that... The only thing that's been discovered by trying to make computers into teachers is that we haven't a clue how people teach and learn. Right? You'd agree with me about that. I mean, it, it's just been 50 years of failure to deliver a reasonable teaching program by a computer because it turned out that the process was far more complex than we thought. Um, so that, that's one motivation for doing this, right? But <laughs> there are also far more uh, suspicious motives. I mean, you might want to sell people robotic companions to replace their real human companions, and I think that's deeply unethical. You might just want to manipulate people to your point of view. Um, and again, I think that's deeply unethical. Uh, so, researching human intelligence, that's fine, but imitating it, why? You know, there are seven billion humans in the world. We're not that short of human intelligence. I'd, I'd, I would side with Alan, and I'd rather we built robots against a specific task because there, I see plenty of good jobs for robots. I was just checking the questions that I'd uh, written down before, in preparation for this, and we haven't actually made it off the first one yet. <laughs> I've got five pages of these. So I'm just going to attempt... I'm going to follow up on something that you just said, Blaine, and attempt to bring it to something that I think is worth saying, even if it is just to get it out of the way, and it's another reference to popular culture, but not so much popular fiction or formal fiction, but one of the concepts that comes up a lot in popular culture when we're talking about robotics and AI is sometimes referred to as the singularity. And I think a definition of it is <coughs> the moment where artificial intelligences surpass human intelligences in terms of heavy lifting and processing power and, and therefore potentially become a threat to us. 
Um, so, to the three of you, and we might as well start at the far end with you, Kathleen. Um, do you, do you want to just give us a brief-ish, pithy, um, <laughs> as pithy and brief-ish as you would like to be, uh, version of what the significance of the singularity is? I think, for me, my understanding of it, yes, there's this idea that machines will surpass our intelligence, but there's a point before it where humans and machines merge and I think that idea that, as human beings, we can merge with machines is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the theory for me, anthropologically speaking. That, that's, that is interesting. That isn't what the question was, though. Yes. <laughs> which, which is fine, because this is a conversation, and conversations meander. But I do want to just quickly focus on the, what we think, as a, as a panel, is the relevance and the... the I, I describe this as being... A potential fiction in terms of the movies, in terms of Skynet or um, Chappie or Ava from Ex Machina. Um, the, is, is the singularity a fiction? Is it important? Is it culturally relevant? Is it re scientifically relevant, is the question, really? I don't, I don't actually have a problem with the way in which... I, you know, I don't believe... I know you're scientists on the panel, but as an anthropologist, I don't believe that there's this scientific world there and there's this fictional world there, and stuff goes on here and it's all right, and then stuff goes on here and it's a bit um, crazy. I think, actually, we live in a sphere which everything has meaning to us in different ways, and we communicate that meaning through different idioms that we have in the world, fiction being one of them. The singularity is, is, is kind of something that you might find in fiction and in science. It's based on a fundamental idea, a kind of evolutionary idea, that you can, with more processing power, it's called Moore's Law, you know, you can increase processing power, and this itself will enable us to develop even more incredibly sophisticated computers, and that itself will launch us into this impossible place called the singularity. Now, you know, I think fundamentally this is about a kind of core primal idea that is present in all humans about wanting to find a connection, be unified with another entity. And you find it in literature. In fact, I was reading um, Freud's book about civilization and its discontents just before I came. And in the same idea, when people talk about God, they talk about this merging with this spirit outside of themselves, and it brings them ultimate bliss. And if you actually read any of Ray Kurzweil, it's very mystical in terms of this union that will occur. So as Kurz, Kurzweil is the, is the, the primary yes. author of the concept <laughs> yes. of the singularity. He works for Certainly Google. the primary... But yeah. uh, Kurzweil is, is a big yeah. proponent exactly. of it, certainly yes. in the public yes. sphere. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. I think it's... Um, there's something very primal in his idea, that something very human about it, even though it's, it's, it has a fantastic element, there's something very hum, human about it. Blaine? I don't mind being called a scientist. I have got a couple of degrees in science, but my original training was in philosophy, so I'm going to say the singularity is nonsense, and I'd really rather we didn't talk about it. Uh, when um, Werner Vinge uh, originally came up with the concept, uh, he was a mathematician as well as a science fiction writer. He called it the singularity because it's like the spot at the middle of a black hole, a point you couldn't see beyond. And if we take it in that literal meaning, this is the point at which we can no longer predict our technological advance, then all bets are off. Anybody can say anything, right? Any nonsense flies. So why, why even talk about it? Uh, but in a stronger, more immediate 2015 sense, when students turn in an essay to me that starts with a line like, given the fast pace of technology advanced these days, or with technology advancing these days, they've already got themselves a D and a red pen, because, <laughs> I, because I will write, learn some history. Technology is advancing really very slowly in 2015, and if you think putting another number on an iPhone is technological progress, think again. Um, and in fact, in many ways, technology's gone backwards. It, takes, it, it would take me twice as long to get to New York as it did for my father, for example. No one's talking about manned space exploration anymore. That turned out to be too hard. Um, and a lot of problems in AI, the vision problem in AI, turned out to be too hard. So the idea that we're in this, this 
runaway acceleration of technology just as false as a point of history. I, I'm not sure I agree with you about two of those. Oh, that's because you're a things. geneticist and genetics is moving forward. I didn't say there was no progress. I agree with you absolutely in that case. <laughs> I didn't say there was no progress, but compared to, let's say, 1880 to 1910, which is the bike, the car, the phone, the radio, the aeroplane, the fridge, the electric light, how much more do you want? Uh, and it took 15 years to build a railway network around this country, get maybe 90% of the population within walking distance of a railway station. No machines, all done with shovels but you and could men say, working. You we, could can't, we, can't do, we can't do broadband in 15 years. And then I'll give you another one, even better. <laughs> it took 18 months from parliamentary approval, from the MPs approving the building of the central line, to trains running. 18 months from parliamentary approval to train running. Do you think anyone could build an underground line as fast hmm. as that now? Crossrail. <laughs> How long is Crossrail taking then, Alan? But you could, you could say... But, 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 no, you could say... build a yeah. third London airport. Yeah. You could say, though, that... Um, you could say the transistor, right? There is a transformational technology which has enabled, in the same way that the underlying mechanisms that have that <coughs> enabled all the, many of the advances that you just said, the, the, the technology advance actually was, was smelting, right? You know, industrial scale um, iron extraction. That's the technological advance, and actually that didn't move and hasn't really moved very far in the last century. Similarly, you could say the transistor is an enabling technology which has which has allowed the building of the second half of the 21st century and, the, and, you know, and on. So that's not saying that technology has gone backwards or has halted. It's just saying that there are nodal points in the history of technology in which, from which you get branching new, te you get branching new evolutions. And, and this is Kurtzweil's argument precisely. In, oh, in is it? In fact, he I says, hate that guy. In fact, he says... <laughs> When artificial intelligence and nanotechnology come together and we can combine them, then it's a singularity. All bets are off. Anything might happen. Well, if anything might happen, there's no point talking about it because any speculation is as good as any other. Um, so, so, I mean, part of the reason we talk about this... We, we, should, we should hear from Alan. Yeah, you know, we should. Yeah, someone we should. spends a lifetime building robots. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I know from visiting his lab and you know, hanging with roboticists. A lot of the problems are really very hard. I mean, it's not a question of accelerating progress. It's a question of dealing with very hard problems. Yeah. So don't hold your breath for these, these wonderful yeah, robots on, that can do Alan, everything. Alan, you're, 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 you are the roboticist on the panel. The singularity, is this something that is bugging you? No, well, it, it bugs me in the sense that I get bloody journalists phoning me up all the time about it. Um, but, um, actually, when I'm feeling particularly cynical, I, you know, and they say, when, they say, Alan, when, are, you know, are we going to, to, you know, make AI smarter than humans? And I say, well, we have already. And they, what, what, what do you mean we have already? And I, of course, I point to, a, you know, chess programs, which have been smarter than most humans for quite a long time, you know, yes. and, 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 I, and they say, oh, yeah, at but that's, chess, that's so just, yeah, at, at chess. chess. You know, and, and I point out that, that um, you know, that we already have driverless cars that are uh, probably better drivers than some humans and quite soon will be better drivers than many humans. So, Agreed totally. Yeah, so, so the point is that, you know, this idea that there is some, uh, you know, point at which everything changes is absurd. Now, you know, again, I'm not answering your question necessarily, but I wanted to tell you another bit of a, a story. Um, so a year ago, I was invited to uh, brief um, a G8 committee. So actually, it must have been a bit more than a year, because then, you know, that was before we fell out with, with Russia, and it became the G7. We fell out with Russia? Uh, and, yeah. uh, and, um, and they have a committee that worries about existential threats to humanity. So guess what it was that they wanted me to brief them on? The singularity. The singularity. Right, not nuclear war or climate change or <laughs> asteroids or Actually, pandemics. <laughs> but something that, doesn't, that well, you guys don't have any concerns about because it won't exist. Uh, well, uh, you know... Uh, Is that what you said? I, of course it's what I said. I, you know, I said, look, uh, you know, the... the uh, uh, the singularity is a kind of interesting, a bit nerdy, you know, thing to talk about in the pub, 
you know, after, uh, you know, after a hard day in the lab. No more than that. Half okay. an hour. Right, and, we'll and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and we, what I said to the, the committee, I've written this, uh, you know, several times uh, since then, is that we're privileging the hypothesis. You know, it, it's a kind of interesting thing to yeah. talk about. It's a thought experiment. But we, it absolutely should not be on the front page of, of, of national newspapers. You know, and of course, every time, you know, uh, you know some billionaire or, 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 very, you know, or Nobel Prize winner, you know, makes a statement about it, it makes the whole thing worse. So you're referring to Elon Musk and... Well, Stephen Hawking was the other one. Yeah, I don't yeah. think has claimed a Nobel yet. No, not yet. But no, anyway, the um, I, you know the point is that that you know uh, it, we really are privileging a hypothesis, uh, privileging a, 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 a worrying about something we, we we really shouldn't be worrying about. And you know, I, but I, but I'm going to add a kind of little rider because I work in robot ethics, and in fact, I even you know I've even started work on ethical robots. Uh, the you know my my kind of uh, you know. Uh, uh, final, you know, throwaway line, if you like, is that uh, we still do need to worry about um, AI and robotics. Oh yes, but not about some future fantasy superintelligence. In my view, Adam, we should we need to be worrying about you know stupid, unintelligent robots right now, and especially the stupid, unintelligent people who are trying to misuse, misapply. Yeah. Um, and, and particularly, uh, you know, claim or believe that, that robots and AI is much smarter than it really is. So well, you mentioned driverless cars, which I think is one that pops up quite often because that is a technology which is effectively here, mm -hmm. right? Um, you see them driving around California now, close to Google. The, often, I've heard the concept of driverless cars being discussed as, well, this is, this is bad news, you know, this is something we should be worried about. It strikes me that an that a AI that is capable of driving a car is not likely to get drunk mm. or to get high and get in the car and is, <clears throat> is therefore probably a desirable thing from an ethical point of view rather than... You know, you could take the stance that actually we'd rather have driverless robotic cars than young men mm. driving cars mm. who are the cause of most accidents. Yeah. Blake. I'm writing a paper on this right now. Well, could you hurry <laughs> up, please? <laughs> um, I'm all in favour of driverless cars. About 3,000 people a year are killed on the roads yep. in Britain, and Britain has the third safest roads in the world. Quite an achievement, really. Um, I reckon, roughly, looking at automation on railways and so on, we could bring that down to 300, so save 2,700 lives. There would still be accidents, things go wrong. It's the great truth of artificial intelligence that if you make a program to do something in the real world, it's not infallible, it's quite fallible. But it'd be a good, as you point out, it won't get drunk, it won't compete with its mates, it won't show off or just get bored and not pay attention and so on. So it'll be much better. Uh, the argument that I think there's a lot of big names in philosophy ranged against me, the argument I have most difficulty with is 3,000 deaths is ethically acceptable. We have chosen as a society to allow those people to die. We think that's just great. We wouldn't be happy if they died in an air crash, but we have different standards for aviation. But it, it's okay for them to die on the roads, so we shouldn't uh, adopt a technological solution. Of course, I think it's just wrong to kill 3,000 people. I mean, I don't usually commit myself on, on moral matters, but I think killing people is wrong. Well, if it's and, a choice and between... The <laughs> and, it's con it's controversial. And, and if, there's a technology, controversial. if there's a technology that would stop those deaths, then we are ethically bound to introduce it. It's as simple as that. That's my claim. Um, is it, so is, is a driverless car acting with ethical... Can, is it even possible to impart ethical and moral behaviour onto... Not at the current level of technology, I say in the paper. There's a lot of people raising all sorts of things about how the cars can take ethical decisions. They're just technologically ill-informed because the, the sensors detect objects. They don't detect the potential moral value of an object, they can't distinguish between a school bus and a wall. You know, you've got to see current sensor technology. There's no way we can talk about driverless cars taking those complex ethical decisions that we just don't have the technology for that. But they can drive a lot safer than humans. So that sounds we, like we a know that. <laughs> that sounds, Kathleen, like a processing issue rather than a, a philosophical issue. At the point where we have enough processing power and it can act at the speeds that are, you know, effective to 
effective enough to deal with the situations that Blaise just describes? Is it just the case that we're waiting for the processing power to get to the stage where we can just go from 3,000 to 300? Um, one thing I never believe is any robot footage. And I <laughs> advise everyone who goes on Google and sees any robots doing amazing things to oh. take it with a pinch of salt. I have... Or to ask the researchers how many times <laughs> they filled it failed falling over yes. before they got that little bit of footage. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's okay, but the way that science works is to present a view of the world when it works. So, I, I don't, you know, I'm not that excited by automated cars. They work in very, very precise settings. They, um, they are basically on circuits that they learn over and over and over again. You couldn't have a driverless car go around Holborn, for instance, it would just crash into things. It wouldn't have the capacity... Currently, though. But currently. Cu currently, yes. Oh, that, okay, that's so, where you're wrong, actually. So, it, would, it would hesitate. The problem with, with the current generation is they're way too cautious. So it... it, it um, and I've also got colleagues who say they'd cut them up deliberately, knowing they would always give way, and so on. Well, uh, and and the, the interesting ethical debate is, do we make them a little more aggressive? And, and that's, <laughs> that's where it gets interesting. But, I, but, I, but the question is, I mean, when these technologies develop, we've got to think about what are the key areas in which technology is developing now in the United States? It's developing around social networking, acts uh, which allow you as an individual user social networking tool to engage with that more increasingly. And this is why the singularity, I think, actually might come true. Because if we live in a society where every day people post different, all kinds of information about their lives continually, and, you know, we, we know already that people live their lives and they might check Facebook 20 or 30 times a day. That's kind of merging with the machine, don't you think? There's already some of that already going on. When it comes to autonomous cars, why do we want to build a future where we design more cars? Why not have autonomous trains or, you know, a different, you know, imagination of different forms of transport? A lot of these ideas are coming out of Silicon Valley in a very, very specific way. And what they are, they're corporate, they're, they're a marriage between corporate enterprises and technological um, kind of actors, basically. And I think that is something to worry about. I, I, I think that whole model that's coming from that, that school has to be questioned. All right, so, so that, I do think that is an extremely interesting point, and one, one that I'm gonna, I ha did have as one of my questions in a slightly, framed in a slightly different way. Um, but you've... In, it strikes me that we've been talking for three quarters of an hour and I haven't opened it up to the audience at all, but if there are any questions, just shove your hand up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How about that? So just before we do that, so if you could have the lights up, and, and I'll leave it to you guys to choose who's going to talk. So just, just give the mic to someone. Boy, girl, boy, girl is what I've been told. Um, is it but I want to say, this, uh, just to ask this question, you've, you've just raised an interesting, uh, interesting point about ownership on these things, and it strikes me that much of the research into uh, artificial intelligence is included, not just in, in um, non-embodied intelligences, but also now with driverless cars and, and, and robotics. Botics. A lot of this is happening at Google, at Facebook, at DARPA. Yeah. Generally, it is my assertion that science works best when it's carried out in, in the public domain. Should we be concerned that these organizations that have little, they have responsibility primarily to private ownership rather than to the public domain, should we be concerned that this is where a lot of the robotics and AI research is going on, Alan? <laughs> uh, yeah, we should, we should. Um, although, you know, I, I kind of have a, a bit of a suspicion that, that despite the hype, you know, that, that, um, that the best innovation is still going on in the public sector, in, you know, in university and, and you know, pub public research labs. Uh, you know, I think the problem is that... Is that, that do, you, do you really think that? Yeah, I, I mean, I... Is that not wishful thinking? I mean, they, maybe. They, Google's got more money than God. Yeah, uh, and it just acquired deep mind. Sure. Which is just around the corner. But, but uh, you know, I, I, I've got this kind of a maybe. It, maybe it is wishful thinking. Sure, but but nevertheless, uh, you know, my my experience. I've worked in industry. Uh, my observation is that no matter what the you know the, the the brilliant as it were founders of those companies, 
Uh, I think that innovation tends to diminish in a corporate environment because, the, you, know, because you simply don't have the freedom. Uh, I mean, the, the, the simple fact is that, that you know, we academics, you know, we can more or less decide what problem we want to work on. I bet, I bet you're, if you're in Google or Facebook, you, you, you don't have that freedom. Shall we go to the floor for a question? Who has the microphone? I do. Hello. Um, it's been really fun so far. This is a slightly long question, so I've written it down. Um, but it's kind of to do with the title, which is really what can sentient machines mean for humanity? So, you know, human intelligence, we've been talking a lot about intelligence as opposed to um, other earthbound intelligence is really characterized by awareness and consciousness. And so if those are not passive, but epiphenomenon, um, they sort of serve an adaptive function by the evolutionary context of being human, right? So what is the proxy for AI as it relates to the fact that this consciousness and awareness is really something that is a emergent or at least certainly not a passive phenomenon? Um, and if machines don't have that, then what does that mean for their sense of self-determinism when in fact they are sentient? Um, and so if I can frame that in terms of... Could you frame it in a short way? Ah. <laughs> Well, what, what, so if, you, if are computers... you getting the gist of this question? Is it, I, I'll, I'll take it if you like. Yeah, go for it. Is it um, <laughs> I don't like to talk about consciousness. I call it the C word. In spite of the fact that I have an office in the Sackler Centre for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. Uh, and I, I don't like having that plaque just across the corridor either because I don't think we know enough about the C word to really do any science at the moment. And I guess I would throw the question back to you. Or I'd say... Wouldn't it be nice to have a robot that was as smart as an ant, right? <clears throat> With 900,000 neurons compared to your 10 billion, right? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to build a robot that could do what an ordinary <coughs> ant does? Because we've, we've tried and we've, we're still not there at Sussex. Um, in fact, we had a famous research program on trying to imitate ant navigation procedures. Now, is an ant conscious? <laughs> You know, you could say yes, you could say no. I'd, I'd, I'd say don't care, right? Um, but wouldn't it be nice to have a robot that was that smart? Is, so is what is I'm going to come back with because, is, is because we're still struggling at that. But is that a semantic problem again that we, we uh, you know, you say as smart as an ant. An ant is, uh, uh, is, is a part of a species that has outlived us, will continue to outlive us, is greater by body mass... By, by biological mass than, than humans probably ever will be. Well, we could say that about bacteria. Are they conscious? Uh, uh, well, that's the question I'm asking. So, <laughs> but it's the, the problem is it, it's a semantic problem. It's a semantic question because we don't know what... We don't know what no one, you can't define consciousness. No one has defined consciousness. Well, that's why I'd rather say, you know, that consciousness is a question for the philosophers. When there's some measurable stuff, then the scientists can maybe do something with it. And then maybe a few decades later, maybe the robot builders but can do something with it. But you, they can't at the moment. So, but, but, and this, this sort of brings it back to the robotics and AI question. But are, are, you, are you happy with the idea that there is nothing special about whatever it is we define human consciousness as and... As, a, as someone who's an empiricist, it is a, an emergent property of, of neuroscience. I'm glad you used the word emergent because I wanted to answer the question by telling you uh, that um, I and others, particularly in, in the field of swarm intelligence, um, have certainly uh, and genuinely observed emergent properties. I mean, nothing like you know consciousness. Uh, very, very simple emergent properties, but. But, uh, you know, th there is definitely, if you like, a, a, an emerging uh, understanding of uh, how to engineer for emergence. So I'll leave that as a little kind of interesting <laughs> nugget. I, the, the interesting thing about consciousness is that the way that it's described often in philosophy and science is it's autonomous. So it's something that happens in an individual that's um, kind of separated, a separate consciousness, so we all carry around a separate consciousness. But there are new ways of thinking about consciousness, and that is, um, well, I won't tell you, but I'm going to do a little straw poll. And I, I wonder what the topic of, you, as an audience, what you've been thinking about most today, right? And I'm going to make a guess. And if you think it's, if you would agree, put your hand up, maybe they won't agree to this. 
But I imagine that since you woke up this morning, you have been thinking about people all day long. You've been thinking about someone you love, someone you care about. You've been thinking about sex. And I think that's been determining most of your daily consciousness. Would any, I don't know whether they'll um, I've agree. I've been thinking about, do you know what? I've been thinking about Pluto all day. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, believe... I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> well, um, we need to have a talk later. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, but I was thinking about sex at the same time. Though. Yes. <laughs> That's a long way off. So, listen, we, we, I don't know, what time were we meant to finish? Um, Nine-ish, okay. So Let, that is an idea of yeah. relational consciousness. You know, as human beings, we are actually thinking about human beings quite a lot of the time. All the time, in fact. In fact, just talk to your friends. All the time we are thinking about other human beings, primarily. So I see consciousness as about our attachments to other human beings, which is a very different scientific, very different from a philosophical or a neuroscientific idea. But not necessarily exclusive to, or it doesn't preclude those other, those other two categories, does it? Um, I mean, I th psychology is a, is a manifestation of neuroscience. I think when they, when they talk about consciousness, they talk about awareness, what we're aware, you know, that we can walk and navigate through this space and how we're able to do it. And all those things are consciousness, but you wouldn't be interested in any of those things if there wasn't someone you were walking to, you know. So if there wasn't any human beings around to interest you, you wouldn't actually get up in the morning. You, that, you wouldn't that, do anything. That seems like a very limiting way to describe consciousness. I mean, just to think about a navigation through a room or something. That consciousness, as unique to humans, it, we are social creatures, and in the emergence... You should read some AI literature. <laughs> the... They, they, well, they try to reduce consciousness to, you know, different parts of experience. So that would, might be one part of experience that you want but, to describe. But as social organisms, many evolutionary biologists assert, without evidence for it, but suggest as an argument that the emergence of consciousness, human-level consciousness, is... Uh, a, has a potential selective advantage, the ability to perceive another person's experience and mind mm. would be selectively adva advantageous and therefore something that is mm. under, under the jurisdiction of Darwinian evolution, right? So it becomes, a, so it has to be to do with the interaction between humans. I completely agree. Well, there are, there are lots of issues with Darwinian, <laughs> Darwinian evolution. In terms of the way that consciousness is modelled, um, so, for example, the, the, what I was talking there about, everybody in this room is thinking about other human beings, their, their family, their children, their lovers, whatever, and they're thinking about it in different ways. What, what da social Darwinists do is they project, they, they, they basically I describe... I didn't say social Darwinists. Okay, <laughs> evolutionary... Yes, Darwinist. but those are very different things. Yeah. So. so, let me give you an example. I was at a Christmas party, and um, I was talking to a couple, and they were describing why the man does the, does the um, plumbing and, and uh, those tasks around the house, and why the woman did the cleaning. And they said to me, oh, because in, in the past, when we lived in caves, right, <laughs> the woman, you know, looked after the food while the man went out hunting and fixed things. That comes right from evolutionary biology. These no, ideas, I, I, I they cannot do allow these that to gendered pass. notions come from evolutionary <laughs> I, biology. I, I cannot allow that to pass. This I is mean, like pop science that filters through well, into the consciousness well, yeah, and, and then becomes the sense we make of our experience. I mean, it's nonsense. Well, it is nonsense. It is yeah. nonsense. But it comes from a very small, specific community within evolutionary psychology, which is a difficult, a genuine, a reasonable and genuine scientific field, which is profoundly crippled by bullshit. Right? And, and often is Men have more sex because, you know, they like to spread their seed around. Women like to hold on to their... Well, I mean... You've, the, all, you've all heard about it. Sure, but, but the, these are pop science. These are, not, these, are, these are not facets of genuine evolutionary thought. They're not testable, primarily, which is why they're not good science. And you're right, they are culturally prevalent mm. um, they, and very repeatable. They're, they're not, they're, they are mostly, for the most part, they're bullshit. Oh, um, well, but that's not that... That's nice to meet someone who agrees. <laughs> uh, I, I've spent a lot of time over the last 20 years arguing um, over the, the points of what we sometimes refer to as panglossianism, mm. right? Mm. The notion that, that all human behaviour can be explained in evolutionary terms. Um, 
I'm not sure this is relevant to AIs. And the, oh, the, yes, um, no. But, but this, AI this is, is a, very influenced. Uh, Ray Kurzweil's ideas are very influenced by evolutionary biology. But you're, so, you're, you're, con, co, you're confusing, or you're, you're, you're using... Uh, there is robust evolutionary biology, and then there is pop science. Mm. And I don't think it's fair to conflate those two things together so casually. Right. Mm. Well, I'm going to have to get some evidence and email you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can, it, can I just try and round this should off? We, should we try and have a second question? Or, or <laughs> yeah, no, I can, can I just try and round this one off by saying... Quickly. There's no prospect of anyone building a conscious robot. Um, I haven't even seen a scientific account of, of how it could be done with infinite processing power and so on. If someone tells you their robot is conscious, they're trying to trick you, or they're just lying, and if they tell you they've made a conscious version of Siri, again, they're trying to deceive you. That's where we are, realistically, in 2015. We're, no, we're not about to build these conscious robots. Do you, do In fact, we don't even know the questions. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Um, not, I, I, <laughs> I agree with the timescale. Uh, but, I, but I think that there is extraordinary value in trying to build um, or at least move in the direction of artificial consciousness as a way of, try, uh, of trying to better understand natural consciousness, biological consciousness. So in other words, I think it's, there is value in you know, building, uh, if you like, taking the first baby steps, which is frankly where we are now. That's, that's where we are. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, let, let, let us. Oh my God! Um, whoever's got the mic, gentleman there in the fifth row back. So I want to come back to the scorn and contempt that was made, that was spoken from the panel about the various people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. Basically, I heard from two two of the panel that these guys know nothing about what they're talking about when they say there's a threat from intelligence in the. And we could include Bill Gates and Steve Wozniak and that, who also have said this is a real problem and we should worry about it. Even if it's only a 10% possibility that it might happen, it's something we should invest significant time. Would you also include in that group of people that you scorn in terms of thinking they know nothing about the possibilities for uh, pro improvements in AI? Would you include Stuart Russell? who is, as you probably know, is the author of one of the most famous yeah. textbooks in AI, who gave a talk in Cambridge recently, uh, basically saying, look, uh, this is uh, within the bounds of what we've been looking for. Okay. And would you deny also there's been any real progress in visual computing vision? I heard that they, you, you were all laughing and saying they thought they would solve it in the 1950s. There's been no progress at all. Would you deny that in the last four years that the large-scale visual... Uh, recognition challenge has been huge leaps forwards by teams from Microsoft, Google, and Facebook who are in this competition every year, and they're now about five okay, times okay. better than they were at the beginning. Would you deny all that? I, I think we get the tenor of your question. Um, I, I think that's, I, and, and I think it's perfectly valid. I don't think it's fair to say there was scorn poured on them, and nor do I think that anyone on the panel said that none of these people knew anything that we were talking about. But perhaps you'd like to respond to the general tenor of, the, of that I'm question. Happy anyone to respond? Go. Um, in, 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 in some ways, I think, it, uh, particularly with Bill Gates and so on, you can make a, a stronger claim than Scorn. They may very well, in this supposed percentage risk, you put 10% on it, I, I wouldn't give it 10%, try to be trying to distract us from real risks that are around now. Um, the existential threat... Maybe it's there, but it's a small risk. But the, <laughs> there was a comment. You made the comment, Google have more money than God. There's an example of a real danger of AI. Happened, already happened. It's a 100% risk called Google, right? I wonder how many people in the room have used Google today. Come on, be honest. Right? Have you, have you stopped to think what power that company has over the dissemination of knowledge? How many of you have multiple online identities? Have you noticed you get different search results for the different identities? Right? This is an example of how dangerous AI can be. Now, I'm prepared to, to, to grant that Sergey Brin and Larry Page, really, they were just you know, nice postdocs at Stanford and they didn't want to do any evil. But now, right, Google is one of the most... It, it, they built an AI product and their supervisor, um, Terry Winograd, an, an ex-colleague told them to put it out there. They put it out there. It was so good. This is how good AI is. They could give it to the world for free and become one of the most profitable companies on the planet. That's how powerful AI is. And you, you, you may fall into the naive view that Google is some sort of innocent encyclopedia that just gives you information. It's not true. It's, it's a 
corporation, its job is to deliver people to its advertisers. That is its legal duty. That is its first legal duty. That's a tremendous power over everyone. You see, but uh, Blaine, you that's, seem, that's, you, that's a live risk now. But you seem to be agreeing with the questioner there that there is a much bigger existential threat as a result of this hegemonic power than we were suggesting at the beginning of this panel. Is that oh, my interpretation? Not exactly. I, I'm, I'm saying the danger is not AI taking over. The danger is people using AI to do bad things. And we, and we haven't mentioned that the United Nations is considering a petition to have a, a moratorium on autonomous weapons deploying lethal force right now. So this is, is, this is, is another 2015 issue. Are you saying there's a lot of there's a lot of things there's a lot uh, there's a lot of things to be worried about AI right now. So you're saying but, it's a dual use technology. Before we get to this singularity it's, or the takeover, you're saying it's a tool, but it's dual use. It has the potential. It's something that we have because it's useful. But it, similarly, it has the potential for great. Harm is that yes. is that effectively yeah. what you're saying? I'd, I'd, well, I'd, I'd make a more general point. I don't know if Kathleen would agree with me. Generally speaking, AI technology moves power upwards. It gives people at the top more power and the people at the bottom less power because it enables them to use all sorts of big data searching techniques, all sorts of manipulation techniques and so on. So what you're seeing is power being sucked upwards into the hands of a small group of people. So does that, that, does that mean... That's a 2015 problem. That's so, not sometime in the future. So some of you guys were down in Puerto Rico when after which at the big meet, one of the big meetings. I think you were there. Were, were oh, you? No, I wasn't. But were any of you there? Murray was there. Right? Murray was there, who's in the audience. <laughs> um, um, but now, now hiding from Google, you can't hide from Google. Um, but one of, the, one of the questions that emerged from that and some of those statements, including from Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, were about these existential threats and worries. So the question becomes, well, how do we, how do we regulate? Is it possible to regulate the current situation? Are we, are we monitoring for the future? Yeah. Can I just say that artificial intelligence grew alongside militarism. It's an outgrowth of militarism. Most computer science of the 20th century was connected to militarism. That is a real existential threat. Using um, computers to deliver more and more lethal weapons to far-flung places is very, very, very real. Now, what they're talking about when they're talking about AI becoming um, too powerful is that they're talking about AI itself acquiring some state of consciousness that it... Yes, they are. Yes, this is what they are saying. It doesn't need consciousness to be dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of will it, will it acquire a consciousness of its own that it can act autonomously in the world, that is what they're concerned about. And I don't believe that, that is a threat. What is a threat is militarism and the way we use AI um, in the military today. You and could, the way that all of you are now products, we're all products in this corporate well, Okay, but world. You, could, you could argue that the, the foundations of the internet were built by ARPA, which was the, the predecessor of DARPA, which is the military research branch of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, the military have helped develop some, of, some major technologies and have led some of the major te technologies over the last 50 years, possibly throughout history, arguably. Mm. Mm. But as a result of that, we did get the internet, mm. right? I think we would have had a communication system another way. You know, the, the idea is that somehow we use militarism in order to deliver these beneficial products to society really needs to dressing because What's actually happening with the internet? The internet isn't all benevolent anyway. I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of harm. There's evidence now that the more that we use the internet, the more that people, the less empathy that people are having. I mean, they're, they're actually starting to find these statistics in the world. The fact that more people view pornography on the internet is having a direct impact on their real relationships in the world. These are very serious issues. And that is a consequence of a technology that itself is driven by a certain kind of consciousness, which is about violence. I, we're way off topic with, with that. It's very interesting, <laughs> but let, let, let's return to the floor. Whoever's got the microphone, um, and, and let's, again, so we can push things along and get some more questions in before 9 o'clock. Um, if you could, a, a brief question about robotics and AI. Hi, yeah, brief question, but um, don't know if it's a brief answer. Uh, the panel kind of poo poo the idea of singularity, but it's the idea of singularity, the danger of singularity, not that machines end up being more intelligent, but we end up being less intelligent because we forget how to do the right thing at the right time. When, when we outsource decision making and, and the, the idea of doing the right thing at the right time to machines, which was a definition one of the panel um, uh, gave, 
does that not make us less intelligent and kind of make the singularity us losing our, our so, intelligence rather so, than So this machines. is sort of version of the technological fallacy, is it? That, that, that as, <laughs> as technology advances, we become dimmer um, because we're not required to use our brains in the same way that we once were. I don't think no, so. I, don't, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I mean, it's a, it's a good point, but I, you know, the, the point is that human beings uh, become differently intelligent all the time. You know, intelligence, whatever it is, uh, you know, it, I mean, intelligence is not one thing that we all have more or less of. Um, it, it, the, and, and, you know, what we regard as useful, uh, as it were, cognitive abilities are changing continuously. Um, so, I, no, I don't think that, uh, you know, we are going to be, as it were, um, you know, we're not, uh, you know, de-evolving in, in a kind of intelligence. There is, there is a I, version I, of this, of what, what Alan was just saying, which is, which is as long as written history, that, that um, technologies have always changed our behaviours mm. and, behave, and, and the, the way that we mm. um, express our intelligence. And that the earliest documentation that I've come across of that was Socrates complaining about writing things down because mm. it made people yeah. stop learning things wrote from memory. Mm. Um, the pencil being a really, really significant piece of technology there. Conrad Gessner in the 17th century said exactly the same thing about the printing press. Mm. Susan Greenfield continues to say this pretty much to anyone who'll listen to yeah. her continuously <laughs> to this day. And the weird thing is it turns out they were all wrong. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think that it's, a, it's an in interesting and important mm. question. Good point. I, I think it's up to you, actually. Mm. No one needs to ride a horse to get about anymore, but there's nothing to stop you learning, and lots of people do. Nobody needs to... Uh, propel a boat by the wind anymore, but there's nothing to stop you learning and plenty of people do. Nobody needs to do mental arithmetic anymore, but there's nothing to stop you learning and plenty of people to do. Yeah, if you want to f turn off the GPS and use a map, yeah. feel free to do it. I'm yeah. going to be doing it tomorrow in an aircraft, yeah. right? I don't need to. If you want to keep your cognitive skills alive, you can. Yeah. Uh, if you want to learn things by rote, one, one in the eye for Socrates says, absolutely no. I, I know lots of stuff by rote. You know, the, the choice is yours. You can be lazy or you can keep your cognitive skills alive. The fact that technology can do it doesn't stop you doing it if you want to. Okay, well, so um, this gen two gentlemen in the front row here have been like, anxiously putting their hands up because you get the, get the mic to them, first row and then second row. So same yeah. rules. I don't know if we're going off topic with consciousness if you want to move on from that, but I think it's possible. <laughs> It's possible to attempt an empiricist definition, which is constant with scientific procedure, and that's to follow the demarcation made by Galileo and Locke in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, the whole of objective talk, um, even culture, but reductionistically, if you just think about the scientific or common sense navigation about the world, aspects of how the world is, can be communicated because they concern primary qualities, mass, length, time, electric charge, essentially, in the classical uh, worldview of physics. Whereas Galileo and Locke recognises something called secondary qualities, what things feel like, what things look like, the redness of red, for instance, which could not, for instance, be communicated to a congenitally blind interlocutor. So there's something very odd here to be explained, which doesn't fit in with the rest of science. And at the same time, consciousness is very odd. I suggest the same problem. Now, I'm not being mysterious about this. I'm a, I'm a physicalist, I'm a materialist. I think there should be some way of uh, designing some general circuit with neurological or transistor-based, which could implement secondary qualities. I mean, that's a complex thing. I don't want to go into it. I haven't got time, maybe, but... What are your comments on that? So, you know, you, I mean, you're raising a lot of important points there about the nature of consciousness, one of which is, I think you're alluding to the concept of qualia. Um, I don't like qualia, but yes, yes. I don't think any of us <laughs> like qualia. We had a brief technically discussion fine, about technically form. fine form, second equality strip. But, but yeah. you're, you're expressing the currently ascientific understanding of this sense of experience, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, how, how, do we, how do we feel about our current <laughs> levels, how do we feel about them? Yeah. How, how, do feel about how, how do we feel about our current, current levels of understanding of what it feels like to see red? I was taught that distinction was down to John Locke, not Galileo, but... Uh, no, but Galileo made, made the distinction, Locke made it in English. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I was taught John Locke, so maybe I was wrong. Um, and I, I think there's a division, uh, there's a division across the channel, in philosophy, a very hard division, and there'll probably be a division between members of the panel between essentially third-person descriptions of the universe and first-person descriptions of the universe. And in trying, in, in Alan's robot sometimes, and, and certainly in the 
scientific study of consciousness, we're bashing these two alternative worldviews against each other. And I don't think in 2015 there's a satisfactory integration of the two. And I think if, if we have a debate, we will, we will fall apart eventually on that split as to, you know, as to whether or not everything is captured by a third person. In fact, we had a little discussion about Qualia in the green room before coming out, and again, you know, the, the scientists on the panel felt a, a third person description <coughs> would capture everything. And you said, I don't you think said we'll in your convince question, Kathleen. You, you I, said in your question, you, used the, you said you're not being, you're, you're, a, you're a materialist and you're not being mysterious a, about this. But there is many of the discussions, many of the philosophical discussions about the nature of consciousness embodied in humans rely on our current understandings being so far off that there is something fundamental that we don't understand about consciousness and it may be an, a, a, fundamental, um, a, a fundamental part of neuroscience that we simply have no comprehension of. That would be a mysterious viewpoint. You know, um, uh, Paul Hogan, for instance... Um Follows that point of view. Um, you know, I, I think there's a there's a kind of, um, uh, if you like, a, a delusion or a myth that that what we will build. Imagine that we can build a, a machine that has some kind of of phenomenal experience. It will not be like us. How will it think? How will it feel? It'll feel like a robot. Yeah. Which is yeah. about, robots which, don't feel like anything. Which which amounts to the same as saying it'll feel like an alien. So I think there's a, there's a kind of, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're really deluded. Even, even if we do manage to, uh, you know, to build something that we, that we imagine is, uh, in, and incidentally, I think there are profound ethical problems, mm. uh, even with, with attempting to build something that has mm. phenomenal subjective experience. Um, uh, uh, you know, some have argued, Thomas Metzinger, Thomas Metzinger uh, famously, uh, that, that, that it, it's unethical to build a machine that may, in fact, experience artificial suffering. But, but even if we do, it will not think or feel like so, animals. So this is, this, is, this is, does this relate somehow to Nagel's what it feels like to be a bat? Yes. To which the answer is, <laughs> only bats know, right? Yes, yes. But, but isn't so, that... So only a robot will know what it is like to be a robot. Okay, well, yes. does that mean that it is ineffable, or, or does it mean that we just don't have enough of an understanding that it, it, is, it will one day will be football. What's, what's the opposite? Ineffable? Ineffable. Effable. 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 Not just football. Well, then, well, then you have to take a position on that divide. I mean, some philosophers think it, it, it is just unknowable. Um, at the moment, we're groping towards it. Mm. That, we're, no, we're not really in a position to, to talk science about yeah. that, I but, think. But I think it, it, is ineff it is effable in this sense, Adam. So imagine we could build this robot that, that we believe, ethically we build this robot that we believe has some phenomenal subjective experience. I think by understanding, therefore, the machinery by which that arises, we have a much better insight mm -hmm. into how to we would have a quite different subjective experience. Okay. Um, uh, the Death Star, Dark Side of the Moon. Thanks for noticing. Um, just wanted to make a very quick comment. I know that's against the rules, but strictly speaking, but um, the Google search bubbles thing, uh, my former supervisor at Burbick's actually doing something on search bubbles and how uh, the results are different for different logins and so forth. So I'm looking forward to the outcome of that myself. Um, I wanted to tie this last few uh, comments with regards to ethics and so forth, right back to the start and what Kathleen had to say about the definition of intelligence, because she mentioned quite specifically that it had nothing to do with affect. And a lot of work recently suggests that human yeah. intelligence actually relies upon affect yes. in order to be iterated the way that it is. Um, and that is that emotion um, gives uh, more strength to certain elements of the information coming in in order for us to give that uh, greater strength in our um, calculations. So affect is actually quite important to human intelligence. And um, if we are creating an artificial intelligence that doesn't have that, then I think that actually goes back to um, the discussion we were having on ethics and morals just then because what you're effectively doing is, is um, getting rid of um, empathy and then it becomes a discussion of empathy versus utilitarianism and, and machines being the ultimate utilitarians and people being the ultimate empaths except when they're not. Um, so how does that all tie in? Do we fundamentally get back to the issue of human intelligence is 
predicated on emotions and empathy and all of those things would actually make it faulty. And the machine intelligence is not that. But why, why is there something special about human intelligence as we understand it, which means that robots will never be able to empathize in a similar way to humans? Is, well, is there something fundamental? If you look at what, what Antonio Damasio has to say with regards to how consciousness, to, to get back to that, um, is built up, it relies on the difference between the internal and the external and noticing that difference. Robots necessarily are going to have a different internal to external experience. So the, the measurement of the difference of what is me and what is other is going to be different for a robot than it is for a person. Just as qualia gets back to how it's different for each individual person internal versus external. Hmm. Anyone? Um, I, I, did, I didn't pick up on Kathleen, but I should have said, if you want to know about AI and emotion, you're much better off reading Aaron Sloman than Marvin Minsky. Um, although he doesn't have any answers or definitive answers, he's certainly much closer to the right questions than Marvin Minsky. You'd agree? Mm, absolutely. Um, and I think in the human case, it, we, there is no division. To separate rationality from emotion is entirely artificial, and the more science we do on this, the more it looks they just don't pull apart in the human case. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we've got quite good performance out of AI without bothering with emotion. I mean, Deep Blue really didn't care whether it won or lost, um, yet it still beat Kasparov, who was probably suffering from caring a little. I mean, I, I, I'm not a a big chess person, but the chess world basically said it couldn't happen to a nicer guy because he would exploit um, opponents' emotions. <coughs> so um, it, playing against a computer, you didn't have that. And, and I've written a number of papers suggesting if we put robots into useful jobs, like exploring Mars, there's no payoff in giving them any affect. You know, we just want them to get on with the job. Right? Um, and because if you want a robot you can fall in love with, then... Uh, that's very different, or you want a robot that in some sense genuinely cares about you rather than just looks after you, then that's different. But as an ethicist, I'd say we shouldn't be straying into those areas. You know, mm. I, mean, I mean, I'm not agreeing with Metzinger here, who thinks it's, it's all out, but I, but I would say I'm deeply yeah. suspicious of the motives of people who want to put emotion into robots. Briefly, if I can. Alan's just going to say something quickly and then we'll move on to the briefly. next question. Um, the, so I disagree here with, uh, okay. with Blay. Um, so I, in this sense, uh, in the last six months, we've, in my lab, we've built a robot that in fact prevents another robot from coming to harm. It's an implementation of, implementation of Asimov's, if you like, first law of robotics. Now that, that, that robot, therefore, has no empathy, but it behaves as if it has. It behaves as if it has. So I put it to you that if we built a very sophisticated set of behaviors, that you know, act and behave as if they're empathic, then that would be pretty interesting, even if we didn't believe for one minute that there was real, as it were, empathy going on inside. And I think that, you know, that in a sense, is a, an interesting philosophical problem. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in robots that, that, that behave as if they're intelligent, because I believe that is intelligence. I think behaving as if you are intelligent is precisely the same thing as yes. being intelligent. I think this is a really yeah. crucial, but you t some of the language that is being used, I, I detect, even when you just said it then, mm. where you speak as though human empathy mm. is also somehow irreducible, or possibly precisely. mysterious, yeah. Uh, and supernatural or unique yeah. to us. Yeah. Whereas I, as a materialist, I have, to, I, I have to rely on it simply being an emergent property of mm. the combination of neuroscience and evolution. Mm. And therefore, mm. as you say, if a robot behaves in a way which is indistinguishable from em empathic behavior in humans, then it's empathy. And right? moral well, realists of the world unite. Yeah. So who said that? <laughs> I warned that we would we split should, along we should this, have it. <laughs> at this point. <laughs> oh, what did you say? Scientists of the world unite. No, I don't, I Moral don't. realists. Who said that? I still Somebody, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, right, you've still got the mic. Yeah. Let, it, let us go on to the next question. Whoever's got the microphone. Oh. There you go, Liz. I think I have a very straightforward actual question. Um, what do you think of the ethics of, like, our current technology is things like driverless cars, so maybe they could eventually replace all of London taxi drivers. We have things in checkouts that you can do your own self-scanning so you don't need people checkout aisles. What's the implications of even this very kind of limited but dedicated task-oriented intelligence on people's jobs, people's livelihoods? Yeah, yeah. 
It's amazing, right. People, people will lose jobs. Um, I don't think it matters for, for two particular reasons. One is, unlike most of the people I meet, I'm not religiously committed to the neoliberal model, right? Um, I think there are other ways of organizing humans apart from around work and payment and acquisition of capital and not being able to buy a house and so on. Um, I, I, I am not and have never been a member of any political party. I'm not trying to force a political <laughs> view on you here. <coughs> but it, it's important to see that there, there are other ways of doing things apart from the neoliberal model. So that's one reason I think it doesn't matter. The second reason is a lot of the jobs you're talking about Kids at school don't say, I want to work on the checkout. I, you know, I, I, I want to do this incredibly dirty, dangerous job. I want to sweep up factories when I grow up. Um, because really, there's an awful lot of jobs that robots should be doing, right? Because they're not really pleasant jobs. Um, I, I think the problem is that no one's making a list of good jobs for robots. And, jobs that we want to keep for humans. And, and now, in 2015, it's about time we did. It's about time we had lists like that. Did, these are good jobs for robots. I mean, decommissioning nuclear power stations. What about going looking for landmines? Typically done by women, I believe, sticking a knife into the ground to find anti-personnel mines. I mean, that's a good... I mean, even the robot builders have noticed that's a good job for robots. Right? <laughs> you know, um, so, have I answered your question? I mean, yeah, there will be unemployment and, and we should wake ourselves up and deal with it, basically. Mm. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Oh, microphone. Sorry, quick off the mark. Run, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's the ethical society. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, for the purposes, for the sake of this question, suppose we could build a sentient machine, uh, as it says on the banner behind you, what would the uh, moral worth be of that machine? I understand your point that it is, they are different from humans, but so are cats are different from humans, but we, don't, we can't necessarily treat them in any way we wish. Would they have a greater moral worth than some humans? Kathleen. Um, if you fancy. I, I make this distinction between harmful technology and hurtful technology. So um, a way to think about this, so we, if we broaden this out to all kinds of technology like the environment, wind, wind, um, wind mills, what they're called? Turbines. Turbines, yeah. They're kind of hurtful because they might annoy you and get on your nerves and um, you know, they might get in the way of your beautiful scene. But they're not creating a kind of waste product that will take thousands of years to, um, to resolve, like a nuclear power station, which is harmful. Because even though that power is produced in that particular way, the consequence of producing that power is harmful. What I think we should do is we should design loving AI. I mean, we should literally use the most glorious and most celebrated aspects of our humanity and develop an AI around it. So that means no violence, because the reality is, if we want to live beyond the Earth to go to other planets, we have got to overcome profound obstacles of technology. And I don't think we live within the framework, we don't have a framework that currently exists that will ever be able to achieve those aims. And I only think by developing a more compassionate uh, and loving kind of relationship with technology and the way we develop our environment and the way we develop our robots, will ever make it possible for us to go and visit other planets, for instance, or even solve human problems. So, okay. compassionate technology. Um, Can I no, let's, let, You get one crack at the whip, I'm afraid, because there's, there's lots of hands still up. And the next mic is on the back row. Uh, it's always a bit uh, disconcerting when you see a debate around hard science being framed at a national, and as Alan said, at a supranational level by 30 years of popular fiction, uh, which is constructive problems that make a good plot line. And there are times during this discussion when it's felt a bit like the debate, the early days of the debate between medicine and homeopathy, between nanotechnologists and grey goo, and uh, genetically modified foods and, and hatred of Monsanto. Um, so how do you think the scientists can wrest the debate back from, dare I say it, the fantasists? <laughs> okay. I've done right, my yeah. best. Yeah, help, help yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm off. I'm going over yeah, here. I mean, I, I, if, if, if I may, Please uh, do. Adam, I mean, this, this is... Um, <laughs> 
so it's no accident that, that I, for the last seven or eight years, I've, I've been leading a science communication unit. I mean, I, I think it's profoundly important um, that these questions, these really, you know, big questions uh, that confront us with, with artificial intelligence and robotics uh, are debated, understood, debated, and decided by all of us. All of us. Not, you know, not just, as it were, the, the guys in the lab, um, and certainly not, you know, the politicians, and absolutely not the corporatists, you know, the, as it were, the elite. Um, so, you know, we, you know, while we're still a democracy, if you, if you believe we are, um, we should decide on the basis of a, of a proper understanding of what the technology is and, and what it might become, we should decide what kinds of robots, what kinds of AI we want in our society. Yes. And the time to do that is now. Absolutely. Yes. Whereas the time to do it for GM was about 30 years ago. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Um, where, where are the mics? And stick your hand up and grab one. I think we've got time for two more questions as long as they're relatively straightforward. Right at the very back there, G gentleman on the bench. You know, uh, when we thought about what London thinks uh, should be, us trustees, about 18 months ago, it's exactly what we thought it should be. Are you, this has been very interesting, superbly chaired, and some very, very interesting questions have been made. Thank you. But what you want now is a killer question. Okay. What I want now is a beer, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But, <laughs> but why, I, I, I don't question. have it, but I would like to say, I think AI, when it was so named in 1956, I think has sent us down the wrong track. I think it should be just competi competi computational power. And this link with human behavior is something which may ultimately be possible. We are at very, very early stages now. Maybe at the end of the century we'll be closer to it. But I think what I like, I resonate very much with what Kathleen has been saying. I think we've got so many bloody problems on this planet. We need to solve those. And let's use computational power to help that. So Sorry, it's a statement. It's no, not, that, a, it's that, not that's, a question. That, it's, a, it's an interesting statement because I got a big bee in my bonnet about naming things. Mm. I find that definitions and name, I think we talked about this last time I was here. Um, uh, in general, I find that naming things, especially if it gives them some sort of bogeyman like status, mm. Uh, is deeply problematic, and defining things tends, tends to limit what you can do with them. Do you think, I'm turning the gentleman's statement into a question, do you think naming it artificial intelligence, which has two emotive words in it, do you think that that has been problematic for the field? Yes. Well, and, and in fact, um, I believe <laughs> no it to be true, it. I believe it to be true uh, that even uh, John McCarthy... Yes. Regretted, yeah, regretted naming it artificial intelligence and, and, and said, said exactly that. Francis Crick regretted naming the most important bit of biology the central dogma because he didn't know what dogma meant. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't just one mistake in 1956. Mm. I mean, we have, we've also gone through expert systems, which is a very big name for what you get. Mm. The, the British name was knowledge-based systems, which is kind of closer to what they really are. And, and of course, Rodney Brooks and the crowd at MIT chose artificial life, which is in many ways even more ambitious than artificial intelligence. Do you think that, Kathleen, do you think that sentient machines is, is, is better? Uh, I think anything that has a sentient consciousness is better. But I think it depends what people do. Like I, you know, people say uh, in, in Japan, for example, you know, they do religious rites for, for Abo dogs. But when people do religious rites, it's usually an affectionate thing that they do, that they're, you know, anthropologically speaking, from the moment in the archaeological record that we put faces on pots, we've been anthropomorphizing our environment. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to say if we didn't do it, we wouldn't we wouldn't even be sitting here because nothing in this room would even exist if nobody anthropomorphized it. The question is, what are we extending into our objects? You know, people who talk about the environment, they, they're not against technological process, uh, progress, but they want to develop energy forms, for example, that could be beneficial, that could be sustainable, that can be long-standing. And I think in the same way, that's the kind of philosophy we should have about AI and robotics. Mm. What ideas are going into it? And if it, 
I don't participate, and nor will I, in any AI initiative that will um, be directly or indirectly connected to militarism. But I know lots of AI roboticists who do. They say, well, I'm just writing a piece of code. You know, do, you know I'm, I'm not really doing it. But you are. Every, all of us are responsible for our actions. And if we are, in, in different ways, contributing to something that can be harmful... But, you know, when, when Charles Simon, he wrote the code for, for Word, right? I'm sure the military used Word, yeah. right? There are better, other word processing but, software is, is available. We, we can't, as, as if scientists... That, yes. If that word yeah, was going to be as used as a, as a kind of a missile that could harm people, then that's a problem. You see, just because the military develops something, it depends what they're doing. If it's the intention of that technology is to create some harm, then I think, yes, we should question all of it. But you can't limit scientific developments on the grounds that one day they might be used for harm. No, that, that I'm not saying about some future scenario. I'm talking about the here and now. What are people doing in the here and now that's contributing to a militaristic activity or a violent objective? Well, potentially all research. No, not in Europe, actually. In no. Europe, we have some... No, but you know, all research that, that occurs within science at some point may be, may be useful, beneficial to military purposes. All, all you know, biomedical research, which is to do with genetic engineering and synthetic biology and these sorts of developing fields which are developing at, 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 in contrary to what Blade says, um, at, at a... No, no, I'll allow that. At, at, at Genetic a, science you did, you did, you did progressing me, nicely, thank At you. a very, very, at an unprecedented rate. <laughs> we, have, we don't know whether certain technologies are, are going to be used for good or for evil. The technology itself is neutral. But as individuals, we can make those choices about what we do in our own working practices and our, in our lives that we live. And if something we create is then used by another, then, then we can take that challenge. But there is so much research happening in AI that has a strong military connection, and I think that needs to be addressed. That is the real existential crisis in artificial intelligence. The fact that you can send warheads off that can kill remote targets, and there's no consequence. The people who are sending them are detached from the, the object that they're killing. Okay, do we have time for one more question? I think we probably do. This gentleman in the front row has had his hand up the whole time. Could someone get a drop a mic to him, quick smart? Run, Forrest, run. Just returning to the, just returning to the thing on the screen there, what about sentient machine? Assuming sentient is equal to consciousness, um, how would you ever know whether the machine you'd made was sentient or conscious, given that all it could do was carry out its program obey the laws of physics, even if it learnt a new aspect uh, that you hadn't programmed into it, it would still obey the laws of physics, and whatever it did. So therefore, how on earth would you ever know that it was conscious? Do you agree, in other words, that you could never determine that fact, even though you might suspect? Al, can you even determine whether another human is conscious? Well, that's, that's the question. It's, it's hard. I mean, what, what you've raised there is an extraordinarily difficult question, and, and, you know, and, it, and it is discussed. You know, it's actively discussed in the machine consciousness research community, um, and I, you know, uh, 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 often uh, the the feeling is, uh, well, we're so far from that being a problem that maybe we don't need to worry about it just yet. But but you're you're quite right. You're quite I mean, right. I could turn it round and say, yeah, there's something very mysterious about how a bunch of uh, silicon or uh, motors and activators could really be conscious or be sentient, even if it told you that it was. But then there's also a deep mystery about how a heap of protoplasm and cells yeah, meat, can be sentient meat. or consciousness, Thinking even if it meat. tells you that it is. <laughs> um, and, and we don't get anywhere by juxtaposing well, two mysteries. We, really. we, we give each other the benefit of the doubt, and we give animals which have we nervous do. systems we do. We do. the benefit of the doubt. So we just we assume that if it squeals, it's because it's in pain. We just assume that. This and the, all the evidence is that's exactly how people will react to the robot, even if it's a cheap trick. This is the point where you all reveal yourselves to be robots. <laughs> As a roboticist, I'm really disappointed that that is your version of the I know, I know. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> When my kids, my kids yeah. often say, whenever they're pretending to be robots, they walk around going, I am a robot. Why would a robot say that? We don't walk around going, I am a human. 
Listen, I'm going to wrap it up now because it is, we're over time, but I'd like you to thank our guests, um, Alan Winfield. Um, I forgot your surname for a second. Blay. Whitby. 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 And Kathleen yeah. Richardson. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.